Okay, I think we're good now. If you're watching, let us know that you can hear us. So. All right. Don't you love technology? Great. All right, guys, take your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, we're just going to look at one, two, three, four verses tonight. Uh, I originally planned on this looking at, I don't know, 11 or 12, but um, then I looked at my calendar. I'm like, oh, we have a business meeting. Uh, and so I'd already kind of struggled with dividing it up anyway. So uh, in, in, first, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 15 through 18. Um, it's just a very personal set of verses for Paul. He then begins to apply them in chapter 2. So they all really kind of go together. But we'll get everything set up. And then next week we'll be in chapter 2, 1 through 13. So let me read it to you. Uh, Paul does like Paul does occasionally and just names names. He's a bold fella and he'll, he'll just call people out. So here's what he says. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. He says, You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me. Uh, among whom are Phygelus, we don't really name kids that anymore, uh, or, or Hermogenes, Hermogenes is probably how you say it, we'll call him Herman. Uh, the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onus. I didn't practice this, can y'all tell? I've been reading it in my head all week. Onsiphorus. On, 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 Onesiphorus. Yeah, there we go. Uh, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord granted him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. So he's looking to the end of time. Uh, and you know very well what service he rendered at Ephesus. Paul begins to name people who had abandoned him. Now, here's the interesting thing. Paul is in jail. He knows He's not getting out. He knows he's going to die. You see that as we progress through the letter. And what, we, what we've seen really in the first part of chapter 1, in verses 1 through 14, is even though he's in jail, even though he knows he's going to die, there's actually quite a bit of joy and confidence in who God is and what God has done. That's where you get the whole, you know, I know whom I believed and, you know, all that sort of thing, the song that we sing. But here in, in these verses, he starts to talk to Timothy about these folks who abandoned him or turned away from him. He says in verse 15, you are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me. And then he, he mentions those two guys. Uh, Timothy's in Ephesus, which is in Asia. Not what you and I call Asia anymore. It's, it's, my, it's Turkey is what we call it, is what it is now. Back then they called it Asia. And so that's where Ephesus is. So Timothy was there. And so he would have known about this. He would have known uh, that these folks had turned their back, had abandoned Paul. And here's the interesting thing. We don't know exactly what he means. We're not 100% sure what he's talking about because he's in Rome. And they're in Asia. But somewhere, somehow, there was some kind of abandonment. There was some kind of them turning their back on him. There was a lack of support. Whatever it might be, he doesn't actually tell us because Timothy knows. We don't know. But Timothy knows, and he's the one the letter was written to. So he, he doesn't have to explain it to him. That's why we don't have the details. So nobody's 100% sure exactly what happened or why. What these guys, were they supposed to be character witnesses to the Romans? Were they supposed to write a letter of commendation? What, what exactly? Nobody knows. But whatever it was, they had betrayed Paul. They had turned their back on him. He found himself very much alone. Except for this one fellow. Uh, and in verse 16, he says, Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus. I'm still not happy with how I'm saying that. Uh, yeah, one here. Uh, For he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. So he comes to see Paul. Now, this is an interesting thing. Paul's in jail, and he's there, and he's, he's very much alone. This isn't like the end of the book of Acts. The end of the book of Acts is he's in jail and he's there and people can come see him. And he's preaching the gospel and he's sharing his faith and he's talking to the Jewish leaders. This is not that uh, because he had to be sought out. Look at verse 17. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. He had to be sought out. This is, not, this is a very different sort of thing. 
And so here, this fellow decides he's going to go find Paul and he's going to encourage him. Paul's in jail. Paul's going to die. He's been abandoned by his friends. He's writing to Timothy saying, you know what happened. You know how bad it was. But this guy, he, he found me and he encouraged me and he refreshed me. Uh, and so here's what he says in verse 18. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what service he rendered at Ephesus. So once again, we don't know exactly what he's talking about. But Timothy knows. So here you have this contrast between the, these two fellows mentioned in verse 15. And then Onesiphorus. Onis, I'm getting happier with that, by the way. Onesiphorus. Why couldn't they just use normal names? You know, like Bob or something. But that's not very Greek. So here you have this guy. He, he seeks Paul out. He encourages him in contrast to the guys who abandoned him. One of the things that we have to be careful with as believers, and this happens at the local level, within the local church. It happens at the, at the larger level, you know, you know, as far as like national bodies and that sort of thing. Uh, we often just end up shooting our wounded. We, we tend not to try to build them up. We tend not to try to encourage them. If, if somebody has had a problem, if somebody is, is no longer, you know, the superstar that they were, they stumbled in some way or things have not gone well, uh, we tend to run pretty quick. Um, we have sort of been practicing cancel culture for hundreds of years now. Uh, because we, and, and often this happens in churches uh, as well. You know, somebody will go through something in their life and, and everybody was buddy-buddy and everybody was real tight. And then suddenly something difficult happens. And whether it's embarrassment or not knowing what to say or not sure what to do, probably not even with bad intentions, we end up pushing that person to the side if we're not careful. Um, this is why I always encourage people, um, be careful on what you, what you share in a public setting. Because you never know how people are going to respond to that. You have, if you're going to share something that is, is, is very personal and is you know, something that is very powerful in your life, something you're going through, something you're struggling with, you need to make sure that you share that in a context of, of people you can trust. Um, and so I, I'll give you an example. I, I, I had, a, had a man one time who um, I don't like. This is just my personality as a pastor. I don't like anybody that I don't know and know well to talk in the service because I don't know what they're going to say and I don't want to have to come back and correct something that, that was not theologically sound, you know. And so I, I've really got to know you. And, and I've also, when people will do things over the years and say, well, I, I just need to, I want I, I need to share my heart with the church. I need to do that. I'm like, you need to be careful because I have seen people get up and in front of a, large Sunday school class or a Sunday night service, typically not Sunday morning, although I've seen this on Sunday morning, somebody will share something and the congregation doesn't quite know what to do with it because it's so personal and so, you know, often dramatic and traumatic. They're not sure how to respond to it. And then the person sort of gets embarrassed about it after the fact. In the moment, they're caught up in the emotion. You know, they, they got to share, they got to do this, and then suddenly, afterwards, they regret doing it. And then you end up having relationships that get a little bit weird, and nobody knows how to act around one another. Um, I had a man one time want to testify to the church that he was going to start tithing. It was weird. Everybody knew he didn't, and nobody should have known it, but everybody did. Right? I inherited the situation. And, and he gave the testimony on a Sunday morning or Sunday night, I don't remember what it was. And he never came back to church after that because he put himself on the spot, right? I mean, he, he really put himself out there and he shouldn't have done that. That should have been between him and the Lord and he should have had that conversation that way. Um, and so we need to be careful in what we share because it needs to be in a, in a trustworthy situation with people that we know are going to love and support, who are going to tell us the truth about it and be honest with us, but aren't going to do what these folks did. See, Paul had been arrested. Paul was in jail. We don't know all, all the things that happened, but they had abandoned him. They they'd turned away from him. He was very much alone. And so we have to make sure that we do not do that to one another, that whatever we're going through, 
um, whether one of us falls into just terrible sin or has tragedy happen to us or whatever, we haven't changed. We're still that same person, and we need to love one another and support one another. It may be that we have to directly confront somebody's sin. Well, that's biblical. I mean, that's, that's part of it. But we still need to be family and all of that. Uh, Paul was not experiencing that from those two fellows. However, this one guy was coming and he was he was supporting him and he was encouraging him. And so he says, you know, in verse 18, you know what he did in Ephesus. You know how much uh, he cared for me. And so he mentions the word refreshed. That's what we're to do to one another. When rather than shooting the wounded, rather than pushing them to the side, rather than saying, yeah, did you hear about, you know, to other people, you know, yeah. And we, we often will couch it in form of prayer requests, that sort of thing. And, and prayer requests ends up being gossip and, and that sort of thing. Rather than doing that, what we're supposed to do is refresh one another and build one another up and pray for one another and support one another. And that that is what Onesiphorus, Onesiphorus did for him. Timothy hasn't abandoned Paul. Onesiphorus hasn't abandoned Paul. But these two fellows in verse 15 have. He's going to mention later that, uh, that uh, everybody else at his trial abandoned him too. I mean, he is very much isolated at this point. And yet he's still calling on the Lord to bless this fellow. Verse 18, the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. So completed salvation and glorification. And even in the midst of sadness in verses 15 through 18, Paul's still thinking about others. He's still trying to bless other people. So I just want to read you some verses uh, about this idea of, of you and I encouraging one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11 says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. When the world is chaotic, which has always been true since the fall, because the world is chaotic, when you and I come together on Sundays and Wednesdays or we see one another out or go out to eat or in one another's houses, whatever the circumstances are, we're there to build one another up and to encourage one another. The, the church is always, for believers, the church is always supposed to be a place of rest and restoration and rebuilding and refueling, if you want to think about it that way. That's one of the reasons we come together a couple times a week. We refuel to go back out into the world to serve him. So we're to encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, he says, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. We're to encourage those who, who, who are struggling. Romans 1, 11 and 12. Paul wrote, Paul wrote, For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That means to, to set up solid. That is that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. He told the church of Rome, I want to come and encourage you because I know it's going to encourage me. And that's what we need. And then the last one, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. This is, this is very relevant for what we're as, as a church, we're trying to get some traction as we're all coming back. It says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is why God gave us the local church. This is why God gave us one another. This is, this is why when you read Ephesians 5, and it talks about how Christ died for the church and gave himself up for her. We have been blessed in that he has given us heaven practice on earth. Because what do we do when we come together? We worship, we pray, we're in God's presence, we're in, his word is here. This is us getting ready to spend eternity doing what we do to, to, to sing and to praise and to worship and to serve. I mean, that's heaven. And so he's given us one another. He's given us this church so that, that we can support one another and encourage one another because we're not going to get that out in the world. The world is lost. The world has fallen. The world is sinful. So we're a safe haven. We're, we're a, a port in the storm, so to speak, uh, as, as the world is chaotic, as, as the, the world, the flesh, and the devil you know, is, is beating us down and, and things are not going the way they ought to and, and we're, we're, we're down and we're 
discouraged and we're hurting and we've messed up. And it's maybe sometimes we just do dumb stuff, right? You ever do dumb stuff and get yourself in trouble? And, and we need to support one another in the midst of the dumb stuff we do because we all do it. You know, and so that, that's what we are to do. But it, we have to have a heart that we can do that for one another, that we can share with one another, that we can be trusting with one another. And that takes time to build those relationships uh, and, and to, to get those things. That's why Sunday school is so important. That's why friendships are important. That's why, you know, being together is important. That's why this past year and two months have been such a struggle. Because we haven't been able to be together like, like we have been. I mean, we still have folks who haven't been able to, to come back yet. Probably some of y'all who are watching tonight, you, you still, you know, you're still not comfortable yet being out. And so this past, you know, 14 months have been really difficult. That you've been separated from other believers. That's a tough place to be. Because God gave us one another. And when that is suddenly taken away, then it's really hard to be encouraged by others when you're not around others. It's impossible. It's just not the same. I know, I, I'm so grateful that we have the, the technology where you know people can come in and, and watch and, and kind of keep up with what's going on. But all y'all who are watching know, and those of you who are here, it's not the same thing. It's it, it's it's good in that there is a connection, but it's not the same thing as as being here together. I mean, you know, I watch. I try to watch at least one sermon a week from somewhere. Um, you know, and it's just, you know, I usually use it on a Thursday afternoon, kind of wrapping up my work week because I'm off on Fridays. So one of the last things I like to try to do is, is watch a sermon. It's just not the same. It, it's just really not as being in a worship service and being with other people. I mean, I get a lot out of it, and I watch some good preachers and friends of mine, you know, in the churches they pastor and all that, and, and the Lord uses that. There's something about being together and encouraging one another. Paul is in prison. He is by himself, and yet this one guy tracks him down. Like, had to go all throughout Rome and ask questions and go find him. And he found him, and he encouraged him. And that's what you and I are to do. We are to find one another, encourage one another, and build one another up. So, well, for those of you who logged in on Facebook or are watching this on YouTube, uh, on Thursday or Friday or whenever it is, a little bit shorter tonight, but thank you all. Uh, for being here, for being patient that we got started a little late because of uh, because of business meeting. But but here's what I want all of us to remember: those at home, those who are in the room. God God could have, if He wanted to, saved us and then immediately raptured us out. That's not what He did. He saved us and He left us here to do a lot of things: to tell other people about Christ, to serve His church to expand the kingdom, but also to encourage one another. He gave us one another, and that's what we're to do. We're to build one another up. And so that is ultimately what he's trying to get across to us, or what he's experiencing in verses 15 through 18, that encouragement that's so necessary. So for those of you who are watching, we're going to log off uh, right now and just do, I'll mention a few prayer requests to those who are in the room. If you don't get the prayer email, uh, email Susan. She can get you on that list. But uh, thank you guys for uh, being with us tonight.